So the next section of the day before lunch, we're going to be doing some obstetrics and gynecology. So we've got Dr. Clark, who's joined us this morning. So thank you so much for doing these presentations um, for, um, for teaching us this morning. So Dr. Clark is currently a clinical teaching fellow in obstetrics and gynecology, working at the Birmingham Women's Hospital and is an ST6 in obstetrics and gynecology. So um, an absolutely brilliant and um, and perfect person to be teaching us today. So thank you so much. I'll hand over to Dr. Clark. Thank you. Hello there. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Clark, as Danielle said, um, and I'm going to be talking to you guys through some common obstetric problems. Um, so I can't cover all of obs and gynae, but I've chosen some three, uh, three conditions or three problems that are quite common um, to just go through with you. And the approach that I'm going to be going with is how you go about assessing the patient as opposed to go going with like a condition in itself um, for most of it. So um, I'm just going to start uh, just talking about the intended um, learning outcomes. Yep. So we're looking at um, discussing key events in antenatal care. So I'm just going to show you a quick timeline um, to get you orientated. Um, and then we'll talk through assessing and managing initially patients with hypertension in pregnancy. We'll talk about diabetes in pregnancy and we'll talk about uh, antepartum hemorrhage and how you go about assessing and working out differential diagnosis for that problem. So in terms of just having a rough idea, I think it's really helpful when you're taking your obstetric histories, which I'm not really covering in a lot of detail here, um, that you have an idea of what happens in pregnancy. Um, things vary from hospital to hospital, but as a general rule, at the very beginning of pregnancy, around about 11 to 12 weeks, um, every pregnant woman would have had to see her midwife. If she's registered with a GP, she tells the GP she's pregnant, then she sees the midwife, and then they take a detailed booking history. But then at that point as well, they take some booking bloods, um, which um, will be the full blood count, the blood group, um, HIV, hepatitis B, and syphilis. In some areas around the country, they might do hepatitis C as routine as well, but it's not all over the country. And they would also check for things like hemoglobinopathy. So the, that's the thalassemias and sickle cells. So we can pick that up in early pregnancy as well. Um, and then everyone gets a dating scan, which um, measures the crown rump length, which is from the top of the baby's head. So essentially the baby's bottom. And that's the best way to estimate gestational age. So before this point, um, ladies would have needed to use the, day of, the first day of their last, last menstrual period as a way to estimate the gestational age. But after this point on the dating scan, we would then be using the scan estimates using the crown rump length um, to determine the age of the pregnancy. On this scan as well, we do the first trimester screen, which uses nuclear translucency and some blood tests um, using the combined screening um, to determine whether there's any Down syndrome, um, trisomy 18, which is Edwards syndrome, Edwards syndrome, and then Patel syndrome, which is trisomy 13. Okay. And those are the key things that happen first in pregnancy. And then we fast forward to 12 weeks, um, 20 weeks, sorry, they're about, it can be anywhere between 18 and 22-ish uh, weeks, they have an anomaly scan. And that's where you check for any structural abnormalities like spina bifida, talipes, any congenital heart problems, um, whether there, there's any sort of gut problem like gastroschisis, on phallocil, those kind of things can be picked up on the 20-week scan. And then thereafter, those two scans would be what most pregnant women who are low risk will get. And then thereafter, they'll have either symphysial fundal height measurements or they'll get growth scans from their community midwife at like regular intervals of four weeks. So 28, 32 and 36 weeks. And then growth scans will also happen at those intervals. At 28 weeks, however, they also get a repeat blood test, a full blood count and antibody screen because women develop antibodies um, during pregnancy as well. So we just screen again and we can treat anemia and optimize the woman for delivery um, as well. Okay, at 36 weeks is also important because we need to start thinking about planning delivery. So if a lady's got a breach presentation, for instance, that's when we start to act on it at that point, because it's actually quite common for people to, for babies to be breached preterm. Um, and so after 36 weeks, we need to start um, making a plan. Um, 40 weeks is generally the due date, um, but as you all know, babies don't necessarily come on the due date, but it's the 40 week mark. That's when most women say is their due date. And as a general rule, if they're completely low risk or there's no indication to induce them earlier, we start offering women um, induction from around 40 weeks and 10 days um, for post dates to prevent uh, complications such as stillbirth. 
And hopefully that's just like a quick overview of what pregnancy is like. So when you're asking women about what's happened so far in pregnancy, you can signpost them to, to saying things like, oh, how were the blood tests that were done at the beginning of pregnancy? Were there any problems? How was the mid trimester scan, which is the anomaly scan, but we'll have information on placental location, for instance, which could be relevant depending on what she presents on. So you're just having a bit of a framework to asking your questions. So I'll just move on now to hypertension in pregnancy. So we're gonna quickly whiz through some of these conditions because hopefully you've come across it in your OBS and gynae placement. So this is just a quick revision, but it's just to just mention a few points. So hypertension in pregnancy is a very important problem. About 10% of women will have high blood pressure in pregnancy and about 6% of them will have preeclampsia, which we'll define in a second. As a screening tool, every woman who is pregnant has a blood pressure and urinalysis at her antenatal visit. Every single time she sees a midwife, every time she attends maternity triage, every time she goes to hospital, she needs a BP and urinalysis. And importantly, at the beginning of pregnancy, so at booking, if she's identified to be at high risk, um, she'll be commenced on aspirin 150 milligrams at 12 weeks. So if you want more information about this, you can look it up in the NICE guidelines on hypertension in pregnancy. But we have what we call moderate risk factors, which a woman needs to have two of. So examples of that would be if it was her first pregnancy or um, she's greater than 40 or the in pregnancy interval between her last pregnancy is more than 10 years. But she's got any family history of preeclampsia. Those would be moderate risk factors. So she'll need to have two of those or more to, to, be, to need aspirin. Some examples of high risk factors where you need just one of them um, will be things like if you have history of renal disease, chronic kidney disease, um, SLE or antiphospholipid syndrome, that will be high risk. So you need aspirin um, if you just have one of those risk factors. Um, so moving on to some key definitions that is worth um, bearing in mind is essential hypertension or pre-existing hypertension is essentially someone who has hypertension, which is defined as blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 before 20 weeks gestation, okay? So it doesn't matter if at booking it was not, but if they develop it before 20 weeks gestation, we'll still consider it as an essential or pre-existing hypertension. And then we class it as pregnancy induced if that high blood pressure um, comes on after 20 weeks gestation and there's no protein urea. And it becomes preeclampsia if it comes on after 20 weeks gestation, there's significant protein urea, which is classed on urine dip as more than two plus or more. Uh, and there's peripheral edema. Just a quick note on that, in the NICE guidelines, other factors other than just blood pressure are now being considered preeclampsia. So if there's fetal growth restriction and some deranged LFTs um, with protein urea and things like that, you might a woman might be diagnosed with preeclampsia even if her blood pressure is normal. Um, then there's severe, it's important to know that severe hypertension is when it's greater than 160 systolic or 110 diastolic, and it doesn't matter if the diastolic is normal and the systolic is abnormal, or the systolic is normal or the diastolic is abnormal. So it doesn't matter the severe hypertension. So pay attention to the, both numbers in the blood. Okay. So now we'll just go through like how I would suggest you approach assessing a patient. So classic presentation would be someone, a lady referred uh, from the community midwife um, by her GP um, to come to triage because they've noticed on her routine appointment, a blood pressure is high. So how would you go about like assessing that woman? So she may either have symptoms or she may have no symptoms. But it's important when you're taking a history to, to ask about four symptoms, which is headache, visual disturbance, radical quadrant, epigastric pain and peripheral edema. Now, peripheral edema is quite common in pregnancy. So what you want to know is, has it come on all of a sudden or has it changed recently? And for visual disturbance, you're looking for flashing lights and vision, um, things like that is what you're looking for. Um, with the right upper epigastric pain is as it says on the tin and with headache, don't forget, it's still a headache. So do your full Socrates and ask about red flags. So things like sudden onset, if it's a thunderclap headache, um, if there was, um, is there's neck stiffness, if there's any fever and you're thinking about meningism. So don't forget, it's still a headache, even though she's pregnant. So don't miss out on that. Um, and then you want the rest of her obstetric history. And then you want to take details about the current pregnancy, whether there any complications have arisen. And then you want to take the rest of the history. Um, and important is you need to take the drug history as well and know what she's on. And then, as always, whenever you assess any one woman in pregnancy, always ask about fetal movements. It, uh, reduced fetal movements is a risk factor for stillbirth. That's why it's an important symptom. Um, and so you want to um, you want to ask that to every woman who presents to triage, every woman you have to assess. I do, hello, how are you doing today? And how's your baby moving? Like I, it's one of the first things I say to a woman. 
just to make sure I don't miss this important symptom. So now that you've taken your history from the patient, the next thing you're going to do um, is to examine her, which is the next logical thing. So thinking about um, examination, the first thing you want is a set of observation, including the blood pressure and the urine, but don't forget the rest of the observation, okay? And then in your abdominal uh, examination, remember we elicited for right upper, upper quadrant or epigastric pain. Now we're looking for the sign, which will be tenderness, okay? And the, the problem, um, the reason why right upper quadrant or epigastric tenderness is important, it could indicate liver capsule enlargement, which can be a complication of preeclampsia. That's why it's an important sign, okay? And the headache could be as a result of things like papilledema, um, which you can pick up on fundoscopy. And on fundoscopy, you can pick up other um, consequences of raised blood pressure, like retinal hemorrhages and things like that, okay? And then the next thing you can pick up on examination, which you should do, is reflexes and clona. So this is not routine in your obstetric um, examination, but if a lady has history of high blood pressure, then you want to be doing reflexes and clonus, and you're looking for nerve irritability. So you'd be expecting hyperreflexia or more than three be beats of clonus. And, and sometimes you might observe a lady on general observation that she's quite um, trembly or fidgety, um, and that's, that's a risk of her going into a complication of preeclampsia, which is eclampsia, which is when ladies get tonic-clonic seizures um, as a complication of preeclampsia. Okay. That's the reason why you're doing your examination. And then the investigations you would do, um, I've ordered it in terms of bedside. So you're going to do your observations, you're going to do your urinalysis. And if it's more than two plus, as we discussed, you send it for protein creatinine ratio. Um, I don't think anywhere uses albumin creatinine ratio, but if they do know that the upper limit of normal for that is eight and for protein creatinine ratio is 30. And so if you ever get a data interpretation station, just know that the upper limit of normal, um, if it's above 30, then the PCR is raised. So there's significant proteinuria. But if you ever get an albumin creatinine ratio, then if it's above eight, it's, that's significant proteinuria. And that's often used in ladies with um, chronic kidney disease and things like that. Uh, and then your blood test that you do, if your lady's unwell, you probably need IV access, um, but then you take full blood count. And what you're screening for with this blood test, I find it's really helpful to think about HELP syndrome, which is another um, consequence or complication of uh, preeclampsia in pregnancy, which the HELP is H-E-L-L-P, um, and it's hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. So the, that's what they stand for. And essentially you're screening for that with your blood. So the, the FBC will tell you about the hemoglobin and hemolysis and the low platelets, the FBC will reveal as well. Um, and then the LFTs are in the HELP syndrome, but the additional things you need to remember is your renal function and the clots and screen. Um, LDH are put there because you can use that to pick up hemolysis as well. And if you think there's a chance that you might plan delivery, um, do a blood uh, group and save, um, if you think that you, she might be delivering um, for whatever reason. And then you do your CTG to just check on fetal well-being and the ultrasound as well will be to check on fetal well-being. So you're doing things for the mum and then you're doing things for the baby as well. Um, in terms of management, uh, the good news is whether it's hypertension in pregnancy, um, essential hypertension or preeclampsia, the antihypertensives are the same. OK, and your overall management plan depends on the severity of the hypertension. What gestation is it she is? Is there a risk to delivering a baby? So if she develops preeclampsia around 38 weeks, you can offer her an induction to deliver the baby as opposed to um, if she was 32 weeks when you're trying to prolong the pregnancy because of the risk of preterm. And then the presence or absence of complications. Um, so just as a note, so some of the complications that I would want you to note down would be HELP syndrome, um, eclampsia, um, HELP syndrome, eclampsia, so I'm just, HELP syndrome, eclampsia, uh, growth restriction in the baby, iatrogenic preterm delivery needing to end up in the neonatal unit, um, things like um, intracranial hemorrhages for the mother, um, pulmonary edema, and like liver failure or renal failure as a result of the preeclampsia. So those are the complications to think about. Um, I've put in, um, I added questions to the slides because I wasn't sure how interactive this was going to be. So um, libetalol um, is a beta blocker and you need to think about um, the contraindication of asthma uh, before you prescribe it. It's also available IV uh, for severe hypertension. 
Nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker and can cause quite bad headaches. So you need to distinguish between the headaches from nifedipine and the headaches from the preeclampsia. Methyl dopa is a centrally acting alpha agonist, antagonist, sorry, and um, it, it's important to note that you need to stop it on day two postnatal because of risk of postnatal depression. So ladies can be on it um, during the pregnancy or ladies could be started on it um, as part of pre-pregnancy counselling and um, when you're thinking about getting pregnant, if you've got chronic hypertension. And then hydralazine is just an IV antihypertensive option for severe um, hypertension or severe preeclampsia. Another drug that I think you need to be aware of is magnesium sulfate, which is used for uh, seizure prophylaxis in severe PET. I refer to if a patient is feeling jittery, if she had hyperreflexia, she had clonus, she had severe hypertension, a blood test is deranged, or you're worried about her developing eclampsia, then you can justify bringing her down to labor ward, putting her on high dependency unit and starting her on IV magnesium sulfate. And she'll need continuous monitoring and one-to-one -one care when you're doing that. So it's a resource we have to use judi judiciously. So we have to really think about why we're putting someone on magnesium sulfate and there's risk of complications and side effects. And it's not a nice drug to be on from patients' um, experience. And the same drug, magnesium sulfate, is also used um, as the treatment for eclampsia. So unlike your normal seizure treatment in eclampsia, for magnesium sulfate will be used to actually try and terminate the seizures. Thank you. Um, and steroids is another drug to be aware of uh, for fetal lung maturation. Um, if, you're cons if the baby is preterm, um, so usually for vaginal deliveries less than 35 plus 6, but if you're considering a cesarean section and she's less than 39 weeks and she hasn't labored, you need to think steroids as well. So those are the kind of situations we'd be using that. And then, so that's it for hypertension. So we'll just move um, on. Um, I'll give you like a 10 second mental break and then we'll move on to the second topic, um, which is um, gestational um, diabetes. So this is the second um, important condition that I think is worth you having a good understanding on because it's easy to ask you questions on it, either in your written exam or in your OSCEs. Um, so it's worth understanding a few things about it. So um, gestational diabetes is quite a common um, condition in pregnancy. It's important because they need increased surveillance. And it's also important because uh, one of the big complications is that it's up to a 50% chance that a lady might develop type 2 diabetes later on in life. And so it's important for that reason as well. So usually we try and identify women with risk factors in pregnancy um, and do um, glucose tolerance tests roughly around 26 weeks. The gestation exactly might vary by plus or minus two weeks. If a lady has had previous gestational diabetes, then um, she will get one as soon as she's booked. And then again at 26 weeks if the first one was negative. And so the kind of risk factors you're thinking about, again, you can see a list of risk factors in the NICE guidelines, but I'll tell you some of them, which would be things like previous gestational diabetes, fetal macrosomia, first degree relative with history of um, diabetes in pregnancy, if a woman's BMI is greater than 35, if she's from certain ethnicities, so Afro-Caribbean, Asian ethnicity, um, those would be some of the common reasons why we would do a glucose tolerance test. And also if a lady has persistent glycosuria, so if on a urinalysis, she keeps, it keeps being positive on uh, either strongly positive on one occasion or lightly positive on multiple occasions, then we'll just screen them by doing a glucose tolerance test. Okay. And how it works is um, they fast overnight uh, and then serum glucose is measured um, um, when they come back, uh, when they come into hospital and then we give them 75 grams oral glucose and then do a two hour serum glucose after they've had the oral glucose. And it's worth remembering the upper limits of normal, which is five, six, seven, eight is a good mnemonic to remember. So if someone has a blood glucose of 5.6, that, that is their fasting glucose is 5.6 millimole per liter, that is high and that would diagnose them with gestational diabetes. And if the 120 minute one is greater than 7.8, that also is confirms a diagnosis of gestational diabetes. So those are the two things. Um, two things that is worth knowing. And this can be either in a later interpretation station or it can come up in your, like the written part in single multiple choice questions. Um, well, and those are the risk factors um, that I've put on there. These are from the NICE guidelines as well. Okay, so I'll just move on to that. 
So usually how do we manage it? Well, she needs um, a specialist diabetic midwife looking after her and she goes under consultant led care as well. But usually the three um, options of medication would be um, two options for medication would be metformin and insulin. Um, but most women are usually started on diet, except their fasting blood glucose is greater than seven or their complications on the growth scans, either macrosomia or polyhydraminose, then they might need to be started on insulin first. But as a general rule, the hierarchy of treatment is they go on diet, then they go on metformin, and then they add insulin if it's necessary. Okay, And they're seen in a specialist clinic. Um, we also have to counsel them quite a lot about the antenatal and the intrapartum risks. Um, I'll just check if I'm going to talk about complications. Yeah, I will. Um, and um, they have to submit blood sugar readings. So they have to do uh, finger prick blood glucose multiple times in a day. Um, and then they have to um, also submit those readings for us to analyse. And, and they need to write notes of what they've eaten, for instance, if the blood sugar is high. Um, and then we would offer them an induction of labour, usually between 38 weeks and 40 and 6, depending on complications or their current management. And in labour, we would need to monitor the blood sugars every hour and they might need to go on a sliding scale. Um, and some of the complications of diabetes in, in pregnancy, so gestational diabetes, is a big baby. And that carries a risk of shoulder dystocia, which is when the baby's head comes out vaginally. Um, and um, and then the shoulders get stuck between the bony pelvis. Um, and so it's one of the big complications we talk to women about, and there's increased risk of induction of labor and traumatic delivery. Uh, the long-term risks of, of type two diabetes I've discussed before. Important to note, uh, postnatally, um, a woman with gestational diabetes can just stop the treatment abruptly. And we would do 24 hour blood sugar uh, measurements for them whilst they're in hospital. The baby will also need blood sugar measurements because of risk of hypoglycemia in the baby. And um, they will need a fasting plasma glucose at six weeks during the postnatal checks with a GP to screen for type two diabetes. Okay. And um, they will get annual blood glucose check and lifestyle advice um, about the gestational diabetes. I think that's it with gestational diabetes. Um, and just, I just put a quick slide here just to remind you of pre-pregnancy counseling, because if you have uh, patients that are unwell, say chronic renal disease, essential hypertension, epilepsy, things like that, they need to have their health optimized. And this is part of obstetrics, it's called pre-pregnancy counseling. They see a cons uh, consultant obstetrician who's got a specialist interest in maternal medicine. And sometimes they might see medical physicians with them as well to optimize their health, give them advice, start them with folic acid um, uh, before, um, before they get pregnant so that they don't have to then face changing anti-epileptics in the first trimester or things like that. So they can optimize things um, beforehand. Uh, I'm just seeing that there's a... Ah. So IOL means induction of labour. Sorry about that. I'm just answering one of the questions that I can see in the chat. Yeah, so now I'm just on the final um, part of the talk, which is antepartum hemorrhage. So we've gone through preeclampsia and hypertension in pregnancy. We've gone through gestational diabetes. And the third and final topic is antepartum hemorrhage. And then we'll go through some questions at the end just to reinforce things. So antepartum hemorrhage just means bleeding after 24 weeks um, gestation. Um, uh, so I've just seen, when would you need to plan delivery for preeclampsia? So usually um, preeclampsia, NICE guidelines advise that we aim to push the pregnancy beyond 37 weeks. Common obstetric practice is to try and get the pregnancy to 38 weeks at the moment. But sometimes a lady is 32 weeks, she has severe preeclampsia, we're starting on magnesium sulfate because her bloods are getting deranged. And so we would have to deliver her free term because of the complications. So as a general rule, if there are no significant complications, we try and push um, to 37, 38 weeks, um, ideally, according to NICE guidelines. Uh, but if complications arise earlier on, we might need to um, deliver sooner. And I'll just try and answer the next question. When do we measure blood glucose? So usually they would measure blood glucose um, first fasting, first thing in the morning, then after breakfast, after lunch and after dinner. So four in a day. 
Sorry, Mary, there's another question on the um, Q&A that's on Zoom, which says, how long should you take folic acid pre-pregnancy for? Um, that's a good question. I think if you're planning pregnancy, take folic acid. I don't think there's like an arbitrary limit that you must have been taking folic acid for three months or six months. So if you're planning it, just take folic acid. But those are high risk. So people who've had a baby with previous spina bifida or they've got diabetes or epilepsy, then we recommend five milligrams of folic acid over the 400 micrograms that women usually take. So it's just when you're thinking and planning a pregnancy, there's no arbitrary limit. Okay, bro, there's no more questions on Zoom. Okay, <laughs> okay. so we'll then go to the, um, so the antepartum hemorrhage, which is just bleeding after 24 weeks in gestation. And important causes I think you need to have in your back pockets for your OSCEs, things like placenta preview, which means the placenta is low line, which just means it's covering, um, it's low line and covering the cervix. Okay. Um, there's difference between placenta previa and low line placenta. So placenta previa completely covers the cervix and low line placenta means it's within two centimeters of the internal laws of the cervix, but they both will cause antepartum hemorrhage. Placental abruption is when the placenta partially separates from the uterus and bleeds between the placenta and the uterus. Um, uterine rupture um, is a common complication or an important complication, I should say, of um, women who have had cesarean sections who are trying out labour. Um, the risk of that is about uh, one in 200 of ladies who attempt labour following a cesarean section. Vasoprevia is a unique cause of antepartum hemorrhage because um, it's the fetal circulation so it's that we're losing. So it's the fetal blood that we're losing. And it's because the fetal vessels run close um, in the membrane, close to the cervical os. And so usually when they break their waters, that's when um, the baby starts to lose its blood and it can be, um, it has a high uh, mortality rate for the babies, uh, about 60%. Um, so that's an important one because of the, the, the fact that it's the fetal blood that's been lost. And then gynecological causes like cervical ectropion is incredibly common and rarely but important malignancy. And then a lot of the time we actually don't know, which can be quite frustrating um, for the patient once we've excluded the other important causes. So how should you approach um, assessing a, a patient? How would you tell the difference between these different causes? Oh, I've got a quiz before that, actually. So um, I've got histories. Um, and what I need you to do is match the history to the correct cause. Um, and so what I have is a description of the problem and all these answers are in the wrong places. And so I think, um, I don't know how it works on the app. Do I just move to the next slide to see um, what the answer is for the first one, the second and third and fourth? Um, I don't know if you can help me, Danielle. If you move on to the next slide, then everyone yeah. happens. Um, okay. You should have the whole history on your phone, but we couldn't fit the whole history onto the computer slide. Okay. Um, when everyone's voted, if you press H, you'll be able to see everyone's Okay. Vote. Okay. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer the first one. <laughs> So um, what's the answer to this one? I'm just going to try and reveal that. Yeah, so this is um, more likely placenta preview. And the key thing in the history that I've put there to help you distinguish is that um, it's painless. Uh, placenta previa is more likely to cause painless bleeding, whereas placental abruption, one of the key symptoms you get with placental abruption is pain. You should, um, so that's why that's that answer. So we'll move on to the next one. So I'm just going to press for the answer now. So I believe this is the case. Yeah, there we go. So this is the case of a 24 year old lady who is presented to triage with vaginal bleeding, no associated pain, but she's had intercourse with her partner this morning and the mid trimester scan was normal. And the information in the mid trimester scan was normal is to tell you that there's no low line placenta. She's not currently in abdominal pain, so it's unlikely to be an abruption. She's had intercourse. Um, and the intercourse just means that the cervix, which a is quite common in pregnancy. And so that means the cervix is red and raw. And so if she has intercourse, she's more likely to bleed. Um, and that's why um, that's, that's the correct answer. So cervicoectropion is the correct answer here. And then I'll move to the next one.
For the person asking the question, why is there not a visa preview? We'll answer it in a second. Okay. So, yeah. So the reason why um, this in this situation it's I've gone for vasa previa is the relationship between the rupture of the membranes and the fetal bradycardia. Okay, that's why I've gone for vasa previa. It could technically also be um, placental abruption, but she's not in pain. That's what would discount placental abruption in this situation. Okay. So vasa previa usually is the when we do the artificial rupture of membranes or she ruptures a membrane and then shortly after, like almost immediately after, she has the she has the uh, fetal bradycardia and it doesn't recover. Sometimes you get a fetal bradycardia and it recovers immediately. Maybe it's because it's positional. Um, but vasa previa, the classic history of vasa previa is there's rupture of membranes, there's fetal bradycardia, and there's uh, and and an antepartum hemorrhage. That's the classic history for it. That's why I hope that answers your question. And then uh, finally, um, this one. So I'm just gonna share the results. Yeah, so you guys have gotten it, it's the abdominal pain. Don't be fooled by the amount of bleeding with um, a placental abruption because the bleeding can be concealed um, in the abdomen. So this would be the correct uh, matches. So as again, it's likely diagnosis based on the history and based on like quite common um, features of the problems. So how would you go about assessing your patient? So based on the key um, characteristics of those different causes uh, of bleeding, you would tailor your history and examination to try and elicit certain things. So you do your general history. So your history of presenting complaint here, would be what is the quantity of the bleeding? Um, is it bright red? Is it just old blood? Um, and then you basically want to know if there's any exacerbating factors like things like sexual intercourse um, or what was she doing when she experienced the, um, the bleeding? And then pain is a key feature as you've seen in the history because it's on, she want an abruption is, will cause pain. Um, and so those kind of things you need to, you need to check. And then you need to take the rest of obst obstetric history. If she had a previous cesarean section, as she had an abruption before, that's going to increase her risk of abruption this time. Um, and so those kind of bits of information will help you um, in terms of risk factors. And then you need the rest of her medical and surgical history. Like a bit of a red herring there in terms of uterine rupture. Has she had like previous um, open myomectomies, for instance, because that she can have like an unusual kind of uterine rupture because of previous uterine surgery, for instance. And then as always, always ask about fetal movements. Um, and then with your examination, you want to do your observations. Now, if she looks like she's lost 300, 400 mils, a significant amount of blood, then I would switch your approach to an ABCDE approach um, and assess her and check her in with dynamic status, uh, put large bore IV cannulas and things like that in and, and, and resuscitate her. Um, on your abdominal examination, you're looking for tenderness. Um, does that abdomen feel hard and woody and really really tender or is it lower down in her tummy where her cesarean old cesarean scar was and is that the place that is exquisitely tender because that might be suggesting a scar dehiscence which might lead to a scar rupture so depending on where it's tender and and how the abdomen feels it might give you some clues and then uh, you need to do a speculum examination to assess the quant quantity of the blood um, and see is the cervix open, what else is going on there? But the speculum examination will help you with that. Um, and then I wouldn't recommend a vaginal examination, which is the VE that I've put on this slide, is essentially the finger examinations that we commonly do in obstetrics to see how dilated someone is. So you wouldn't do that at all um, if you don't know where the placenta is. So usually the 20 week scan or the mid C scan or the anomaly scan, all the same scan, um, where they tell, it tells you the placental location. So you need to check that before you ever do a vaginal examination. So you don't inadvertently uh, poke a placenta previa. That's one. So um, then again, you then do things like your analysis. Um, you can do a CTG to get the information about the fetal well-being. This is really key when you have a lady with antepartum hemorrhage 
because if the fetal monitoring is abnormal, then it might mean she needs emergency delivery, uh, whatever is going on. If you can't correct it enough, she might need emergency delivery. Um, you need IV access. In obstetrics, we tend to use just gray cannulas. Sometimes we'd use white, but you need large bulk cannulas, you need multiple, and you need to take blood. Um, full blood count, group and save is important. If you think she's bleeding catastrophically, please cross match. Um, Clyde Hauer is a test we use in obstetrics when a lady has antepartum hemorrhage um, and she's rhesus negative um, and it's to check for fetal maternal um, circulation, um, um, basically to look for fetal blood in maternal circulation. And it also helps us um, with how much anti-D we need to give. So the standard dose is 1,500 units, but sometimes the lab will advise you to give more if there was a large amount of fetal blood in the maternal circulation. So Clyde Howard as a test would use in bleeding in pregnancy above 20 weeks, uh, we'll, we'll be checking that. I've put using these and clotting screen again, if it's a large bleed, you would need additional tests. So um, in terms of imaging, if you don't think it's an abruption and you just need some, a scan and the lady is stable, then you can send her for a departmental ultrasound scan um, to look at the baby, to look at placental location, to see if we can um, locate why she's bleeding. Okay. And then management plan, you always admit, it doesn't matter if on speculum is only about five mils. If you see fresh bleeding, you admit. The question is usually, do we go to the antenatal ward we send her to labor ward or does she need to urgent delivery so she needs to go to theater straight away um you need to do resuscitation as i said if required if she's bleeding a lot and you think you might have to deliver because of the bleeding and she's preterm consider steroids and here magnesium sulfate is for neuroprotection for the baby okay it's to stabilize the membranes in the baby's head to reduce the risk of cerebral palsy um if it's a preterm baby so we're talking less than 33 weeks for magnesium sulfate Involve your seniors, ask for help. And if she's rhesus negative and she's had a vaginal bleed, then she needs anti -D. If she's also had like a car accident, uh, which um, where she's had trauma to her abdomen, then she needs anti -D as well. And you need to evaluate her for risk of abruption, but she needs anti -D. That would be a sensitizing event for anti -D. Okay, any questions on that? So we'll just do a couple of more quiz questions and then I think that would be the end. I'll take some more questions. Um, so we've got a quiz question here regarding uh, preeclampsia. So the question here, oh, the question here is, uh, she's 42 years old. BMI of 30, she's gravid at one paranoid, she's attended her antenatal board appointment, her booking BMI is 37 and her mother had preeclampsia. She's otherwise fit and well and her blood pressure today at booking is 138 over 82. What is the appropriate treatment to start her on? Just see if we have a couple more answers, otherwise I'll just go for it. So, so some people voted libitolol, some people voted aspirin. So a few things that I want you to look at in the question is, one, her blood pressure. Her blood pressure is 138 over 82. So that blood pressure is normal, okay? So it's less than 140 over 90. So what I'm trying to point to you, out to you using the uh, question is she's 42, so she's older. She's in her first pregnancy. She's grabbed a one para knot. She's BMI is 37. And she's got a family history of a first degree relative with preeclampsia. So she's got four moderate risk factors. But that's why aspirin is the correct drug and all the antihypertensives are not the correct answer because her blood pressure is normal. And it's on the high end of normal, correct, but it's normal. Um, and cobagulin just has no indication here. I've just put it in there because it's the only drug I can think about. OK, so I hope that sort of clears things up. The, the hint in the question is her blood pressure is normal. That's why antihypertensive is not the correct question. So then the next one is just a simple, uh, well, it's just a question, take back the simple, which one of the folate and liver enzymes is expected to be raised in pregnancy? So this will help you with your data interpretation of the LFDs. So 
So yes, uh, those of you who have chosen ALP, so alkaline phosphatase, you're correct. So with re reviewing bloods for a lady with preeclampsia, I know I whisked past it earlier, but the key thing to know is it's the AST and ALT that can get deranged um, in, in preeclampsia, whereas ALP, the way I remember it is the P and placenta start from P, um, and the placenta produces ALP, and so that can be raised in pregnancy naturally. And so it's not a, a complication of pregnancy, if you see what I mean. And so if it's raised, this class is part of the normal range in pregnancy. So you don't need to worry about it when you're reviewing your LFTs um, with someone who has um, preeclampsia. But things that you'd be looking for in preeclampsia that would be worrying is low, low HB, low platelets, increased creatinine, um, and raised ALT, ASD. Those would be the things that would worry you to suggest that this lady is having, having um quite bad uh, preeclampsia. And I think that was the last question. So any other questions um, from any of you before we end this? Doesn't look like there's any questions on the Q&A. Okay. Um, but if anyone has anything, feel free yeah. to just pop that in there now. Um, someone's just put, how about gamma GT? What no, gamma GT is not raised. In fact, we don't use gamma GT a lot in pregnancy. We don't have reason to use it. Okay. There's not been any others. Um, I don't know if you've got someone there. Ah, I can see one on here. When do we give anti-D? So anti-D should be, is anti-D, the job of anti-D is to mop up any rhesus positive blood in a woman who has rhesus negative, uh, rhesus negative blood group. So if I just explain rhesus isoimmunization to you quickly. So the problem with, um, with that is, a lady who is rhesus uh, negative, if she's pregnant with a baby who is rhesus positive, that baby's um, blood can be recognized as foreign by her, her own circulation. Um, and then she creates antibodies to that baby. Usually it's not a problem for that pregnancy. It's usually a problem for subsequent pregnancies. So we give anti-D in ladies who are rhesus negative, one prophylactically, so they'll get it twice in pregnancy, uh, especially at 28 weeks, they'll get it and they'll get it earlier on in pregnancy and they'll get it following delivery of the baby as well. They'll get anti-D just to mop up any rhesus, um, pos um, rhesus positive blood that might have gotten into their circulation. But the other times you give it, we call them sensitizing events. So if the woman has any bleed in early pregnancy, she has recurrent bleeding or she has surgical management of miscarriage. If she has a car accident, amniocentesis, um, chorionic villus sampling. So anything that could increase the chance of that fetal blood getting into maternal circulation, that's when we give anti-D. Nowadays, we have um, cell-free DNA tests. So if a lady is re rhesus um, negative, she can have tests to try and determine whether the baby is rhesus positive or not. Because if that baby is rhesus, um, rhesus positive, um, then they don't need to do any additional tests. Okay. Well, let me see if there are any more questions. Do you ever use ALP in pregnancy? No, it would have to be like something like if it was 1,500, that's quite high. So I would phone a liver person to make sure there's nothing else I need to do. But as a general rule, if it's just mildly raised, we don't do anything with it because we don't, we don't use it because we know it's secreted by the placenta. answer that one i think that's it for the questions i think just to keep to time i think eleven fifteen is, is, is all. perfect thank you so much for that presentation it was really helpful there's no other questions in the q a mm. thank you for answering all of the questions that came through um so if you want to take a couple of seconds um mm. i'm going to move on to our next presentation which is um focused on gynecology mm. 